Okay, so today we're going to talk just about D365's inventory. So what we're going to do is we're going to uh, go through the products and then we're also going to then go through how you then release the product as well as all the configuration that's required in order to get a product active. So within this example, uh, we've chosen that we're going to use the configuration based dimensions, so not the constraint based. So what that means is we can then set up different uh, configuration groups, uh, which will then flow through when we get into the bill of materials, items like that. Um, so we're gonna leave bill of materials uh, out of scope for this video. What we're just gonna do is, how do we create a product um, that will suit our business need, needs later down the line? Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through all of the actual configuration options as well as what they uh, mean uh, for the business and what their practical implications are. So if we go in here and we go in new, well, there's different types of products. So within here you got product type, item or service. So in this example, we're gonna use an item. A service will be used later though for subcontractors. So when we do subcontracting work uh, from the manufacturing floor, we need to make sure that we record those subcontracting services uh, as a new product, but we won't go into that just yet. So let's choose item. We're also gonna choose that it's a product type of product master. Okay, so having a product master allows us a lot more flexibility to create things like uh, variants of that product, um, especially, you know, in, down the line with filler materials. So there's three actual types of pro uh, configuration technologies. There's a predefined variant, which Microsoft gives you. So that's really for simpler businesses um, where there's not that many variations of their items. So for example, they give you some default ones called color, size, um, I'm not sure what the other ones are offhand, but they give you some, I think four or five stock standard uh, variants. You can also rename those to meet your business. I believe, however, though, in this scenario, we're gonna need something a bit more configurable. So that's when you'd use the dimension-based configuration. So then you actually set up different, your own unique configuration dimensions. And then lastly, there's a constraint-based configuration. So constraint-based configuration is very powerful, but it does take a bit of uh, organizational maturity to implement. So for example, a constraint-based configuration means you can set up a bill of materials that will allow constraints. What that means in practice is you can say that if I choose a certain configuration, then other configurations are, can no longer be chosen. So what this does is it significantly reduces the size of your bill of materials. So within a very complex scenario, constraint-based configuration is definitely the way to go. However, there is a bit of a learning curve, quite a steep learning curve, and an organization really needs to culturally be at the right point in order to adopt it. So for this, we're gonna choose a dimension-based configuration. We're gonna, I've created some example ones here. Um, so what we've done is if we look in here, I've just created, the, we're gonna use the Birdsville in this example. So over here, we've got configuration. We can say it's active and we can use the configuration for purchase prices as well as sales prices. So what that means is let's say we have a configuration of type, um, I don't know, length and we choose a two meter versus a four meter. When we purchase it, that there's obviously an implication of having that greater length. We're gonna pay more theoretically. Same thing with price. If we're gonna sell a four meter uh, item versus a two meter, that's gonna impact the sales price we then pass on to our customers. So I've ticked both of those as true. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, so, okay, so we can choose the bird's vault and let's choose the product number. So we can go Birdsville, Birdsville, and Birdsville again. Okay, so now all we've done is we've created the product master. So product master doesn't really mean much in terms of selling uh, and purchasing. It's really just a template that allows us then to uh, go on to the next step. So within Dynamics, what you do is 
with the product master you release those products into specific legal entities so within large multinationals uh, the a common example is Amazon they'll sell certain products within certain regions but not in other regions so if Amazon had a television for example that they wanted to sell in the States and Australia but they wanted to exclude it within the UK and Europe they could then release that television into the American company as well as the Australian company but exclude it from the UK and European operations so let's do that now so we're going to release this product okay so we're going to choose the product we want to release and we're going to release this into the legal entity okay so select product variants to release okay we're not going to go into that at this stage um so let's just carry on and we're going to release it into vita rv this will take a bit of a few more well, hopefully not a whole minute but it'll take a bit of time just to process and release that and now we can see it's completed so if i go in here and I actually go to my release products I now know that product has been released into um, ARV legal entity so let's have a look for it we're gonna and there it is so you can see it's been released okay so there's a whole bunch of stuff in here so let's actually go through every single configuration uh, that you can use for this product a very quick thing that you're going to have to get used to is uh, you want to make sure this product is actually valid uh, you can't do anything if you don't have a valid product um, so let's say you can see this one won't be validated a value is missing item model group but as we go down the process we'll start filling out all of these configuration items and I'll explain what they're used for so let's go here general we have to have storage dimension groups and tracking dimension groups on every item um, so we can go over here and we can look so a storage dimension groups indicates how you actually store that item so when you're looking at warehousing so in advanced warehousing you'd store items at a, a location and an aisle generally um, so within dynamics you generally have a site so uh, within the site you'd have multiple warehouses within those warehouses you'd have locations within those locations you'd have aisles so storage dimension determines that so when you then actually send in a picking list to the warehouse guys it will then determine or it will allow them to pick it at the storage you uh, indicate so over here I've got default but let's go look at default and how I've set it up Oh, ignore that. Oh, it doesn't allow me to go straight in. Um, let's see if I can get around that. No, okay. So I've set up for this just a site in a warehouse. So I'll choose that there. Okay. Now, the tracking dimension enables us to track items. So within large scale operations, uh, often the two, well, the two that Dynamics use is you can track items by serial number or by batch. So what this allows is it allows that when we get laid down in the process, if we ever need to do a battery call of a faulty process, battery call of a faulty item, anything like that, we can then track it down to the inventory as well as what sales orders were associated with it, as well as what purchase orders were associated with it. So this is really fantastic uh, when you need to do a product recall. Um, serial numbers obviously uh, can be then also used for things such as warranties. So if you then track at a serial number and the after sell services comes in and they want to define whether that item is still under warranty, they can use the serial number in order to determine that. So I've also just set up a default one. I think I'm not tracking this item uh, within that. Uh, so this is probably no tracking, but we'll see later. So let's go, okay. Cool, so we've got that. Now item model group is always required to, okay, so. We've got two year, which is finished goods and FIFO. So item model group determines a lot of things. Um, this is a very important configuration setting to get right. If you get this wrong, uh, it can cause a lot of issues within your implementation. So 
I'll go through it a bit here. So first of all, it's very important to see what you can see here is the inventory policy says stock policy. Okay. Um, you can also see the inventory model is moving average. Um, so the inventory model allows you to choose moving average, FIFO, um, LIFO, uh, as well as standard cost. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to pause this here. Uh, just hold on. I'll pause this and continue. Just my system's having a few issues.